He's an award-winning investigative journalist who has covered momentous worldwide events, including massacres and revolutions. And he is dauntless in his search for and exposure of the truth. Please join me in giving a warm welcome for the founder and editor-in-chief of whowhatwhy.org, Russ Baker. Good afternoon, New Porkshire. I was trying to think of something I could do with pork that hadn't been done yet, but that's probably been done. Um, I uh, am delighted to be here. I was particularly excited to see how many young people are here. Uh, they're not all here right now, but I know they were out partying last night, so hopefully they'll trickle in. It's very exciting to me to see young people uh, engaged uh, and thinking for themselves. And um, I was sitting by the campfire last night. How many of you were at the campfire last night? Okay, a lot of you, yeah. And I was sitting there and I heard two people behind me talk about politics and I turned around and they must have been about 21 and I thought, wow, what is wrong with them? <laughs> and then I thought, well, what is right with them? And then I thought, well, everything is right with them. This is really, really cool. So uh, it is great to be here. I did not know what uh, Porcupine Fest was, I have to confess, when I received an email asking me to come. And the first thing I thought was maybe it was like one of those conventions where people bring their pets and, you know, they put, uh, they put, you know, gerbils or whatever in their pants and weasels and then they pop up and sort of frighten people. And then I thought, well, that's actually a good metaphor for our politics today because you got these sort of, uh, who keeps popping up? The Clintons and the Bushes, right? And uh, you got the Clintons and the Bushes and I was like, where have I heard those names before? You know, and, and uh, this interests me because we, uh, we come from a background where we had a revolution against a king. A lot of people don't remember that, but, but we did. And we didn't want uh, royalty and we didn't want dynasties and, and look what we've got. Uh, and we've got now the, the real possibility that in our next election we're going to have uh, the third Bush running against the second Clinton. And I happen to know that the fourth Bush is in the wings and the third Clinton is in the wings. So, yeah, yeah. So, so get ready for a uh, get ready for a long time of this kind of thing. And what I find so interesting about this is that people don't seem to care. Have you noticed that? It doesn't really bother people that we don't seem to have many choices. And this is really, I think, what I'm going to talk about today is about our, our lack of choices. And I know that you, as uh, free-thinking people who come here and set up your booths and sell and offer all kinds of innovative things and help each other out, that you, uh, you like choice. You like a variety of things. You like uh, a healthy uh, debate, a good argument, and a variety of viewpoints. And you, you don't like orthodoxies or everybody following a kind of a group think. Um, and yet, look at our country. Uh, we have a, an establishment and a media, and to a large extent, a, a populace that is perfectly okay that the candidates have been sort of pre-digested for us. And, you know, what, what, what does this all mean? I mean, uh, to me, the, the best way to understand America today is to go to the movies. And I would recommend a movie called The Matrix. Or, uh, do you remember The Truman Show with Jim Carrey? Yeah where he, after long, he finally realizes his whole life is a sort of a setup, a whole play. Creepily enough, that is actually more accurate, a more accurate reflection of what we're dealing with than uh, the more sane uh, explanation, which is that everything sort of happens by accident, that, uh, uh, that the chaos, um, the, the endless wars, the uh, perpetuation of this 1%, a very, very small number of people who seem to control almost all the resources in this country, and even more, uh, all of this, uh, it, it, we just sort of, eh, you know, just take it for granted. And so this is really, there really is a crisis in this country. Uh, it's getting worse quickly, and our ability to mobilize people to do something about it is absolutely imperative. We, we face a uh, discouraged, 
demoralized public. Um, most people uh, do not know about this, do not think about this, or if they think about it, they immediately say, I can't cope with this too depressing, I'm out of here. And we've really got to do something about it. So that, that's what I'd like to talk to you about today, what, what we can do uh, about this. But let me give you a little bit more background. In, in 2003, I was living in, in the former Yugoslavia. I'd been sent there to train journalists there in how to do investigative reporting about their government, how to keep their government honest. And I was actually paid by the U.S. government to go there and only took me a little... <laughs> Uh, you, can, you can laugh there. And it only took me a little while to realize, you know, they want us all to go and report on the problems in all these other countries, but they don't really want us to report about the problems in our own system. And uh, the next thing I noticed was when you start digging for answers, you very quickly go down a rabbit's hole. And my book, Family of Secrets, which is there in the back, and I hope you will pick up a copy. We're happy to let you have it at cost. Uh, we we dragged them up here because we thought you might find it interesting. Uh, this is not material that you'll be familiar with, and I wasn't as a longtime journalist. I didn't know any of this. And in fact, in the course of researching this thing, I discovered how little I understood about what really is going on in this country. And I had the uncomfortable experience of having to go to the establishment and say, hey, there's really something scary, really creepy going on here. And uh, they don't quite know how to handle it. And so I've got a major publisher that's the same publisher who put out Harry Potter, by the way. Um, and I went to all kinds of other people who needed to get me on TV and so on. And I said, there really is something creepy going on here. And, and, and the, re the way I found that out was I began trying to figure out, because I was living in Yugoslavia when the, when the, uh, the second uh, Gulf War started. You know, we got two of those. We like to have all, everything in, in twos if we can. Uh, the, uh, the Iraq War. And where we discovered there were no weapons of mass destruction uh, and that the people who said there were probably knew that there weren't any. Uh, and that was okay with them. And so um, I felt guilty because all of these Yugoslavians kept saying to me, you know, we had a war here and you're all giving us a hard time, but you guys have wars all the time. You got wars all the time everywhere and from what I could tell, people in your country don't even talk about them. You know, and, and it's true. Like, I, anybody know how many wars are going on or how many countries the U.S. military is in right now? All of them. All of them. <laughs> 180. 180, whatever. It's, it's just staggering. I mean, there, there are operations going on everywhere. And um, so I felt guilty, and I realized I needed to get back to the United States. I needed to report on how we had gotten into another war, what was going on. And then it was 2004, and John, uh, George W. Bush was running against John Kerry for re-election. And I thought, well, I suppose Kerry gets this one in a walk. He's a decorated war veteran who's also uh, was at the time, you know, sort of ostensibly, and I say that, use that word advisedly, uh, 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 more against war. And yet, here he was running against George Bush. George Bush had, had got us into a war under false pretenses. And then it turned out he was sailing along to re-election. And I said, what is going on here? How, how is it that this man is sailing to re-election? Uh, so I decided to come back to the country and start investigating that. And I spent some time traveling around the country asking people, how do we get a president? How do we get this fellow? Because I'm sure some of you voted for him and you may well like him today, but I think even his close friends would say he was not the most uh, articulate, the most vi visionary individual we ever had uh, running this country, you know, and, and, and how out of all the people, I mean, honestly, couldn't many of you do that job? You know, and, and so how did he get to the top? And I wondered that, and I began investigating that. And the more I did, I began looking at his family and trying to understand, because he wouldn't have been president if his father had not been president before him. And they both, they, they both had the same first name and last name. We actually found that a surprising percentage of people who voted for George W. Bush the first time actually thought that he was his father. I kid you not. Uh, so anyway, I decided to try to learn more about the family. And then my question was, once I wondered how the, the son had become president, I started wondering, well, how did the father become president? And you may remember that the father was a little bit embarrassed because he said, I really have some trouble with that vision thing. You know, he, he really was a little kind of milk toasty and all that and wasn't really 
too much of a leader uh, either. And so I began looking at the father. And I began noticing things about the father that interested me. And one of the things that interested me the most was that he became president because he was vice president. And he became vice president because he was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And then I thought, why was this guy the director of the Central Intelligence Agency? And furthermore, do you know that the CIA headquarters is named after him? And he only served for a single year. You had people like Alan Dulles, who were really instrumental in creating the modern CIA, who were there for 10 years. But it's named after this man. And I went back and I said, why was he CIA director? And I went and I started reading up. And the articles from that period said, Mr. Bush, who has, get this, no related experience, was chosen because he's well-liked. I mean, you know, if you go back and you look at what was going on at the time, for the only, the only point in our history that Congress was really doing its job, it was investigating the Central Intelligence Agency and all of these, we later learned all of these assassinations going on all over the world with our tax dollars, with our, without our uh, approval of people who had been democratically elected in other places. And that's what they were doing. And so all this started coming out. It was right in the mid-70s. Senator Frank Church's committee, some of you older folks may remember that, and they were really getting into all this stuff, poison umbrellas and all kinds of crazy stuff they were doing every, everywhere. And so uh, uh, why him? Well, the, what I found after investigating him was that it, he was not inexperienced. That was a lie. The true story was he was experienced and he was chosen for a very deliberate reason. He was chosen because he was trusted by an inner circle of people who were in the CIA as lifers and also people outside, generally in the corporate world, who have a lot of influence in shaping our policy and they chose him and they told him, you go in there and you stop what Frank Church, the Senate and the House are doing. And that was his job. And he had been in the CIA already. Okay, Do you, I'll repeat that. He had been in the CIA already. Nobody knew it. He'd been in the CIA for decades. Frankly, he was a CIA guy right out of college. He was a first naval intelligence, then CIA deep cover as an oil man. And so we ended up with a president of the United States who was just like an equivalent of Vladimir Putin, a lifelong guy from these very dark uh, intelligence services that we don't know who runs it, what they do, why, there's no accountability. The presidents really don't have any say over this. And so then I got really interested. I said, whoa, there is something going on in this country that I do not understand. And I went deeper and deeper, and then I found out somewhere that George H.W. Bush, that's the father, that he'd been interviewed about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, well, he was interviewed about other things, and then the, the interviewer from a foreign TV crew said, Mr. Bush, you've led such an interesting life. Let's say the day Kennedy was shot, where were you? What do you remember? Where were you when you heard that he was shot? And he froze. I don't know. How many of you were alive when Kennedy was shot? Okay, how many of those of you, how many of you do not remember where you were when you heard that Kennedy was shot? One person, okay. We have a medic standing by right over here. <laughs> Six months old, okay, that's good, that's good, all right. Uh, but the, these, you get my point, and so this was very, very weird. How could he not know? He was 40 years old. Uh, he was running for the United States Senate in Texas, in Dallas, that's where Kennedy was shot. How could he not remember where he was? So I thought, that is something weird. So I decided, I gotta find out where he was. Well, that took me several years and way down a bunch of tunnels in a rabbit hole, and I came, <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow. And I started getting into territory that when I began talking to my editors and my friends who worked for the New York Times and NPR and all those kind of places, and I said to them, listen, Am I losing my mind? Because this is terrifying stuff. And you know, I've got a professional reputation. I, I went to the right journalism school. I got all the pedigree. I cannot afford to commit professional suicide here. And I said, but this stuff is real. And I said, what do I do? And, you know, do I just stop? And one guy, uh, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner from the New York Times, went to lunch with me. I told him everything I'd found. He sat there silently, looked at me, and he said, you better watch your back, buddy. 
Okay, so just to give you a sense of what we in the media deal with, we deal with terror. We deal with terror that if we're going to get outside of the kind of group consensus, uh, we're going to get our heads handed to us. And so this is really, this is what I'm talking about the matrix, is what we report to you it's not that it's untrue. It's true in a very superficial way. You know, John uh, Kerry did fall off his bike, I guess. You know, uh, uh, a, a general uh, was removed ostensibly for drinking. Do you know about this, uh, the head of the uh, NORAD? Uh, but it turns out in almost, in many of these cases, some cases there isn't more to the story. Sometimes it is what it is, but in many cases there's more going on. And then you find out that that general may have been forced out because he may have been involved in some sort of an attempted silent coup d'etat in the United States. Now, you're going to look at me, you're going to go, is this guy crazy? This sounds ridiculous. How could this be? And I'll tell you why you say that. Because it's too upsetting. It makes us very, very uncomfortable. I noticed a woman just got up and left. It, it makes us very, very upset. You know, you feel knots in your stomach, don't you? Because most of us don't know what to do about this. And most of us don't do anything. And, uh, you know, the other day I was talking to a man who worked for Richard Nixon. He was a, uh, he was a top official at uh, Bear Stearns or one of those, you know, big investment houses, worked for the President of the United States. You know what he said to me? He said, you think there was a coup against John F. Kennedy? He said, I'll tell you something. There was a coup under Eisenhower. Remember Eisenhower with his speech on the military industrial complex? By the way, driving over here, you know what they call it? The Eisenhower Highway System. Have you seen that? I mean, we, we, we'll talk about Eisenhower with highways. We won't talk about Eisenhower and what he said, which was, I was a general, and I can warn you that basically the generals have taken over this country. And as far as we know, they may be running it right now. And uh, this, is, this is a problem, you know? And so it's not just the generals, because the generals, some of them try to do their job. There are many fine people in the military. There are many fine people in the FBI or the CIA or police departments, but there are also many people who are not so fine. And that really... Uh, is the problem. Um, and so, uh, so I call this talk the American fantasy bubble. And this is about the notion that we, we live in this kind of a fantasy. We, we are, we're deluged with consumer products, aren't we? We're deluged with choices. So somebody had, I don't know how many flavors of ice cream here. You know, this gives us the feeling of freedom. And we think we have freedom because we're allowed to do lots of small things. You know, we can set up a little business and rent kayaks. And, you know, I know you guys think that there's too much uh, regulation. I understand understand that, but they really don't care that much about this stuff. The, the name of the game is the same that it's been in most uh, empires throughout history, and that is the control of valuable resources. That is what almost every war is about. And I could tell you, and, and, and I run a website called whowhatwhy.org, I hope you'll check it out. We were the first people to look at the, uh, the uh, invasion of Libya. It turns out there was nothing, there was no reason to go in there. Uh, he was not suddenly killing large numbers of people. It was a coup d'etat. It was engineered actually by the French and the U.S. decided pretty quickly they're going to get the sweet crude oil if we don't get in there. So the U.S. decided to jump in and take the lead on the thing. Uh, and then the Italians decided to get in and so on. But this goes all the way back to World War I and the Versailles Treaty. It was all about carving the world up and making as much money as you can. And so then when you begin tying it back to the 1%, you begin understanding what's going going on. Um, what I'd like to do is, believe me, I can go on for hours about this stuff. I suspect you have some questions. So let me just say a few more things, and then maybe we'll just go to have a little conversation. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the perception of freedom in this country is partly because we don't have enough freedom, enough time to think. Right? We all work, we have families, we're busy, we have very little bandwidth. We want to enjoy ourselves. If there's more people, way more people out there than there are in here. We want to enjoy ourselves, we want to have a good time. And so our bandwidth for what you might call public affairs or you know, supposedly non-essential information is very, very limited. And I can tell you, once we get finished arguing about the Kardashians or the Duck Dynasty or something like that, we don't really have any more time uh, to talk about the generals or anything else because we've got to drive the kids to school. And so this whole great, you know, American entertainment state, 
you know, it is what it is, and it does provide entertainment, but I can tell you that the powers that be love it. They love the fact that we have an endless supply of movies and uh, streaming, this and that, and so on, because it just fills us up. It fills us up, and then we want to take a nap. And so this is my concern. My concern is that the media doesn't know what to do about any of this. Most of them don't even know what I'm telling you. Uh, and this is because it's in a kind of a loop. You know, I, I live in New York City. I live in Manhattan. You know, it's supposed to be the elite of the elite. I meet these people all the time. You know, they don't know shit. Okay? I mean, I go to dinner parties and stuff with people from all these major networks and stuff, and they're bragging about how good friends they are of Hillary or whatever, and then they're shocked at me and what I'm talking about, and they don't know because they're all in this bubble too. You see, they, they make good salaries, they got three kids in Ivy League schools and stuff. They don't want to hear that the work that they do is highly inadequate to the task. They don't want to hear that this country is in the middle of an emergency and that if the people, you know, we criticize Germany where really very okay people. Germans are like everybody else, and people in Chile are like everybody else, and people in Vietnam. People are people, you know? And yet we, we're we taught that, that, that the other is the enemy, right? We're all in this together with Dick Cheney and whoever, you know? And, and we're all against some unnamed people in another country who they used to be our friends. Remember that? Iran used to be our friends. The same people now are our enemies, and it's okay to bomb their wedding parties and stuff like that with drones. So. Uh, we, we, we've, we've got to figure out how to break out of this loop. And I, I, I just want to say that, that everything changes with a few people. It changes with a handful of people. I'm going to say that that handful is the people sitting right in here. Uh, give yourself an applause for even coming here. I'm going to say that it starts with the people in here. Forget about the people out there eating the pork. It starts with the people in here because you guys are change vectors. And I'll tell you what I mean. My book, Family of Secrets, from the same publisher as Harry Potter, I was told I was going to be on every major show in America. Now, a lot of you probably never heard of me, and the reason is I couldn't get on any of those shows. Originally, I was going to be on every major show you could think of, and in the end, uh, they all canceled because they got scared. They literally, they got scared. All the major media you can think of. I have letters from publishers saying, I only wish I had the cojones to publish this. Okay? So that is what we're dealing with. But the change comes from a few people standing up. And I'm fascinated by your project here to come up to New Hampshire. Uh, I need to study a little bit more, but I think this is, this is fascinating to me because, uh, I, you know, I, I remember going to a baseball game. You know when they do that thing, the wave and everybody, you know, whatever. And I thought, how does that work? So I, I said, I got like four or five friends and a few people sitting next to us. I said, here's what I want to do. I'm going to stand up. You know the, the clapping where they all clap in unison and then the, the whole stadium claps? I said, I'm going to start clapping and then after five seconds, you start and then you start and then you start. We had like seven people. We got that entire baseball stadium clapping. And that to me is a metaphor because all you need, all the rest of the people can be taking their nap or whatever is get over there and kick them in the butt because that's what they need. It's going to be a few of you. It's going to be a few of you. And here's the really good news. A lot of this stuff can be done with almost no effort at all. Find some source of information you like. I hope you will. We have some sign-up sheets back there. Get on our mailing list for who, what, why. We, we think we're doing journalism that's more honest. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We don't take any corporate money or any ads, any money from political parties or, or unions or anything. Uh, and we really are interested in being agnostic and going in and saying, whatever the issue is, we don't have a dog in the fight. We want to look at as best as we can at the facts and figure out what's going on. We think that's a valuable service. Uh, we want to grow this. We want to grow this as a, as a collaborative project with all of you. We want to travel and speak and, and meet folks and get them involved. We, a lot of our staff are volunteers, which is exciting. But it doesn't have to be us. It could be your project. It could be whatever it is. Find something that you like that you think is going to make a difference and then start that multiplier effect. You know, just, just get online. You know, just I, I say become a pajama jockey. You know, 
know, get up in the morning. You don't, you don't even have to get your clothes on. You know, get to your computer and just start pushing this stuff out because you push it out on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and more people see it, and then they push it out to more people. And, and I think this is how it's going to work. Um, so I, I am actually weirdly, maybe naively, but weirdly uh, hopeful. Uh, and as I say, you're, you're extremely creative here. Uh, I try to be creative. I think we can all be creative together. And uh, we don't really don't have any choice, do we? We really don't have any choice. It's not like this is an extracurricular activity. <laughs> you know, preserving freedom and preventing uh, uh, totalitarianism from coming to our country. I mean, this is not an optional thing. I think it's something we, we can agree that we all have to do. So I, I'll be, I'll thank you very much and I'm happy to, uh, to take some questions. Hi. Uh, have you ever done any investigation on CFR or Council for Foreign Relations? Uh, the question was, have I done any research on the Council on Foreign Relations? You know, there are a whole bunch of these kind of entities. You probably have heard of Skull and Bones, um, the Trilateral Commission, all of these things. What they are is, I don't view them as quite as much sort of sorcery or something like that. They're the Bilderberg group, you know. These are basically members of the 1% socializing you know we're socializing why shouldn't they socialize it just happens to be when they sit down and you know if they had this many people in the room they could flip the world tomorrow you know so they so they talk and they they sort of agree they have some speakers who tell them how to think about things uh, the, from the think tanks or what have you and it's a kind of a self-perpetuating system CFR is another one and if you look at CFR I mean some of the editors of the establishment liberal magazines that ostensibly would criticize all that they are actually members of the CFR the establishment has managed to capture even a lot of the so-called dissidents, if they invite you to a place at the table, it sort of corrupts you, you know? And then you start thinking, wow, this is pretty sweet. I'm, I, I could never get on TV before, now I'm on MSNBC. And then they say, don't, don't talk about the Kennedy assassination. Don't talk about the Martin Luther King assassination. Don't talk about Robert Kennedy's assassination. Don't talk about Malcolm X's assassination. Don't talk about, I could go on, you know, don't talk about, don't talk about how come the FBI uh, knew the older brother of those two Boston brothers with the bomb. They, they were in his house before the bombing. Hello. <laughs> uh, and then he said, yeah, we asked him if he was a terrorist, and he said no, and that was that. You know, our vaunted FBI. So, you know, uh, real problems out there. Next question. Yeah, so I would say you're talking to a, a more enlightened crowd. I'd say that most of us aren't afraid of some of the questions that you're asking. We're obviously not the major media, so we can't support you, uh, you know, to get it uh, vocally that way. Um, but. Uh, some of us do and, and don't vote. Um, that's you know necessarily a thing. But you're right. We're coming up against a very possible Bush versus Clinton situation again. Is there anyone in the presidential field that you feel might not be that scary of a candidate? Well, you know, I, as a journalist, I a I don't like to endorse anyone, and b I stand ready to be disappointed <laughs> for whatever I say. I, 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 I will say that some of these people who are going to be labeled fringe candidates, particularly, for example, Rand Paul, uh, more his father, but Rand Paul is what you got, uh, and uh, Bernie Sanders from the adjoining state of Vermont, I think are people who, considering that they are in establishment institutions, tend to speak their mind more. Uh, and some hope, uh, some people think that Elizabeth Warren, I don't know if she's going to run or not. Uh, you get people. Not going to run, yeah. Uh, you know, and and so and so, you know, elections. This is a whole other issue. At who, what, why? By the way, we're beginning a an electoral democracy unit. We're trying to raise the funds to hire more reporters to start looking at the whole voting process itself. Because I don't know how many of you know this. Thank you. I don't know how many of you know this, but the, all of the voting is completely uh, opaque. It's not transparent at all. Uh, when you go in there with one of those DREs, you know, a little computer screen, you type something, you have no idea whether your vote is counted right because there's no audit trail at all. And, and almost all the voting machines in this country now are owned by two companies headed by people who are, who are open partisans. So these are the kind of things, and then the press can't cover it because they go, that's too boring, that's too technical, you know? So yeah. 
Uh, you mentioned the Boston Marathon bombing just now. I'm from that area, and I first of all want to thank you and your team at Who What Why for the coverage that you've given the marathon bombing. It was so refreshing to have somebody, because our local media didn't ask any tough questions at all. So now I'm curious, now that the death penalty has officially been handed down, and uh, what, what are your thoughts on the statement made by Jahar Sarni of the other day and his apology? Well, the thing that struck me right away about that bombing was, if those two guys are jihadists, well, you know what jihadists do, they, they, they do it to make a statement, don't they? They make a statement, they take credit for it. These two guys, we went back to his dorm room and they went on with their lives. I mean, why would you plant a bomb where nobody knows you did it and not make any statement and you live in that town and you have friends, I mean, they said that they hated Americans, but actually their friends were all Americans. The older brother's wife was a blonde from Rhode Island. I mean, it doesn't add up, doesn't make any sense. And again, people start getting mad at me because they, the, 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 the brainwashing is so intense all the media, all of them, 100% of them, all said the same thing. They right away said they did it before there was any trial. Uh, they were given federally, do you know this? Their lawyers were federally appointed and paid, I think, $3 million to say that they did it. They went in, I was there, they went to court, and the first thing they did, they said, uh, uh, Your Honor, this was the defense. He did it. Our client was guilty. Boy, that's a heck of a defense, you know. So our, our whole criminal justice system is collapsing. The FBI uh, is, is a very, very problematical uh, agency. I'm sure many of you know. I, I think I, some of the FBI agents uh, in the audience might like to clarify this for us. <laughs> Uh, you know, they have a long history of, um, of, of uh, infiltrating groups of peaceful people who are uh, talking about their, uh, their rights in our society and filing reports on them and uh, making life difficult for them. So we've got a lot of different things to work on in this Boston story. I hope you'll go to whowhatwhy.org and read those stories. We've written 74 articles on this. I've been interviewed by the, the PBS station, WGBH Boston, about this story. Boston Magazine interviewed me about our coverage, the Boston Globe. They don't want to cover it themselves, but they know there's something hinky going on. They're saying it doesn't add up. And, you know, the U.S. government has had so many cover-ups. I don't care if it's Watergate or Iran-Contra or 9-11 or whatever. I can tell you, not in any one of those cases did what those commissions reported uh, uh, add up to what actual fair minded investigators found. I'll just tell you one thing. According to Mohammed Atta's ex-girlfriend, he had six pilot's licenses from different countries. Now, you want to tell me that a guy who was training how to fly a Cessna in Florida, who they said couldn't, you know, was a beginner, he had six pilot's licenses, and this is not interesting to the FBI? So, anyway, I could go on on this stuff. There's quite a few of these cases. Sir, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on ISIS, the root cause, and who's funding them, who organized them, and why they seem to have such head esteem. Yeah. So here's ISIS, right? Uh, it's another one of these weird things. Comes out of nowhere. It's like one of the best armies in the world. They got unlimited amounts of, uh, of fuel and vehicles and weaponry. They you know, how is that possible? Honestly, the best, most expensive military in the country cannot stop some guys who are controlling, what, half of Iraq? I mean, they really, frankly, they threaten Baghdad. <laughs> I mean, what was all that for? How many of our people died? How many of their people died? I mean, th th this is insanity. And I, again, I have to just tell you, I look at these things and I say, I would like to put some reporters on that story to find out what's the real uh, back tail to ISIS. Uh, we do know that uh, they, they have received support from Saudi Arabia uh, and some of the other uh, oil-bearing countries. And we do know that some of that is a fight against Iran. And this, again, gets down to natural resources largely. Um, so I, I don't consider myself an expert, but I can say I've seen enough uh, uh, smoke to know that there's fire there. I just want to say my, my son, Ross, is the defendant in the Silk Road case. And, was, um, and I just want to corroborate what you've been saying, that we've seen up close and personal, that the government does um, have a lot of things that it's hiding, and that um, I've gotten to the point where I don't believe the mainstream media most of the time, because we're not getting the full story. I just know that just from my son's case, so. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, 
Um, she is the mother of Ross from the Silk Road case. Uh, you know, another another case is that of Barrett Brown. How many of you have heard of him? The hacktivist journalist uh, who was originally given a hundred year sentence for running some links, uh, posting some links. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of people are being uh, prosecuted. A lot of things are being criminalized in this country. There is not a vigorous discussion of this, uh, not by our elected officials and not by the public either. We're, we really are kind of kind of asleep on these things, but but they're they're happening uh, on a regular basis. I think we probably need to stop. Is there maybe one, one more question? I'd like to know what you think we could do to maybe encourage the mainstream media to start being more honest so that we get more of the facts. Is there anything that you see that we could do to it? Well, it, you know, honestly, if I thought we could encourage the mainstream media to do a better job, I'd still be in the mainstream media. <laughs> I, I think what we need to do is vote with our feet because I could tell you this, as soon as a Julian Assange comes along or a Snowden or something, first, you know what they say, first they attack them, then they ridicule them, and then they embrace them, whatever that saying is. I think that whether it's who, what, why, or if you have some other thing that you prefer, support a... Support support better journalism because these people, you know, they're the, most of them are for profit, and they start looking if they're losing viewers and and readers and so on. They start saying, "Hey, you know, we better copy these guys and and be a little edgier." Uh, all right, one more, one more, yeah. Uh, you had um, mentioned earlier about a coup d'état against Eisenhower back in the day. Um, I'm wondering in your research down the rabbit hole with the power structure and everything like that, if you've uncovered any kind of evidence that there's a current power structure between high-ranking military officials and civil authorities today. So the question is, do I see any indication of cooperation between the military and high-ranking civilians today, or powerful civilians? Uh, absolutely. Uh, all you have to do is look at what very young generals do when they retire. They go on the board of these large uh, so-called defense companies. Defense, of course, is totally the wrong word. That's part of the whole, uh, the whole brainwashing thing is that we call it defense when it's offense or offensive. Uh, and, and so, you know, these... I mean, this is, you know, I hear different figures. I, I hear figures of, you know, between 20% and a third of our economy is, is about war. And so I don't care what you make, you know, you're carrying, holding a soda in your hand, a cup, whatever. All those companies, their biggest client is the military. And so it's this machine that has to keep going because they're making a lot of money on it. And so, yes, absolutely, the generals very much are under pressure themselves. And very interesting because we're starting to hear from people in the military who don't like it. We're starting to hear from people in the FBI who don't like it, people who are in the CIA who don't like it. There are people out there who really are troubled by what is going on, and they don't want to do it. But the truth is, when they retire as a general in their early 50s, and they go on to five of these corporate boards at twenty to $100,000 a pop to attend a few meetings, uh, go on CNN or something as a so-called expert to be paid a whole lot of money, and they're, you know, they've got to talk favorably about the uh, it's it's a it's a kind of a feedback loop, and, and and it is a real problem. All right, listen, you've been very very patient. Thank you very much. Please pick up a copy of the book. I'm happy to sign it for you.